format where we continue to bring authors and new books to you. I have the pleasure of introducing our event this afternoon and I am delighted to welcome Nathan Hale. You can click the link we will drop into the chat box to get your own copy of Nathan's new book, Blades of Freedom, A Tale of Haiti, Napoleon, and the Louisiana Purchase. If you have a question for Nathan, you can click the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and add one there. At the end of the chat, uh, Nathan will have time to answer some of your questions. You can also upvote the questions you like and want most answered. For the teachers in the audience sharing their screens, thank you for entering any student questions. If possible, it'd be great if you could note the student's name, grade, and school. Let's please keep the Q&A box for questions only. Thank you. Now onto the event that you're waiting for. Nathan Hale is the author and illustrator of Nathan Hale's Hazardous Tales, the Eisner-nominated New York Times bestselling graphic novel series on American history. He also created the sci-fi horror comics One Trick Pony and Apocalypse Taco. He illustrated the graphic novels Rapunzel's Revenge and Calamity Jack, along with picture books, including Frankenstein, A Monstrous Parody, and The Dinosaur's Night Before Christmas. He lives in Utah, and P.S., he is not related to America's first spy as far as he knows, as I understand it. Okay, and I'm going to turn everything over to Nathan. Thank you so much for being here. Hello, hello. I am so excited to be here. Um, my name is Nathan Hale. I am the cartoonist who draws the Hazardous Tales series. And because I'm a cartoonist, I always like to switch away and share my screen. So let me show you what's going on right here. I, there we go. Um, so I'm Nathan Hale. I do the Hazardous Tales books. Can you believe there have been 10 books in the Hazardous Tales series? I have probably only read a handful of series that go up to 10. I can't believe I have done 10 books in this series. Now, here's the crazy thing. A year ago, when we were thinking, me and the publisher were thinking about this book launch, book number 10, they had a crazy idea. They said, you know, what would be cool is if we sent you to the locations of each of the books, you know, Connecticut for book one, and right here for book two, the DC area, uh, for book three, the Donner Party, Summer in California. I mean, the list went on and on. And they wanted to do these 10 books in 10 days. The one I was the most excited about was uh, book number eight, The Raid of No Return. They were actually going to send me to Hawaii, to Pearl Harbor, to do a bookstore event there. Of course, all of that got destroyed in the pandemic. And now I am Zooming with 10 different cities. It's almost as fun, right? Anyway, I love politics and prose. I have been there a couple of times and I will never forget the first time I went to politics and prose. I went in there and they had all these stacks of books to sign and I sat down to sign the books before the event. You know, here's me sitting down to sign the books. And the fun thing about being at the bookstore and signing books is you're there for a couple hours and the bookstore uh, owners and workers come over and they say hi and they came over and they said, do you know who was here last? And they told me that an author was there before me a few weeks earlier. And they said, do you want to know what this author did? And I said, ooh, tell me. I love hearing crazy stories about other authors. And they said, this crazy author brought a snow machine like they have at ski resorts. These giant snow machines. It's got to connect up to hoses and stuff. It's got workers who run it. And it shoots snow on the ground. And all the kids get to have a snowball fight. But it was a cold and rainy day in D.C. Not quite cold enough, though, to turn it into snow. In fact, it turned it into a solid sheet of ice out there in the parking lot. And everybody, as they tried to walk from their cars into the bookstore, they were crashing and dying all over this sheet of ice on the store. Maybe some of you remember that. That has got to be the craziest author event I have ever heard about. I have never heard of anybody putting out a sheet of death ice in front of the store. But I always love that about politics and prose. So the new book is book number 10. Uh, hopefully a lot of you know what the Hazardous Tales series is. If you don't, it's a series of graphic novels, comic books about American history. Uh, each one covering a different topic, a different time period. And this one is a time period I had never uh, done in any of my books before. This time period is right around 1803. The main, if you had to put it together as one big subject for this book, uh, that would be the Louisiana Purchase. Um, now, what I learned about in school on the Louisiana Purchase was one thing, that it was a good deal 
and that Thomas Jefferson worked it out. Here we go. Gotta do my Thomas Jefferson here. There you go. Thomas Jefferson looking like Fred Flintstone a little bit there. Here we go. Thomas Jefferson, number three president. He uh, wrote the Declaration of Independence. He was a very popular uh, president. And he is the guy who made this Louisiana purchase. That's really all I ever heard about in school. Um, so when I started this book, I wanted to dig a little deeper, find out what happened. One of the first things I learned is that he didn't want to buy all of this. This was a crazy dream. He hadn't even thought about getting all of it. All he really wanted was a piece of the city of New Orleans, maybe the whole city, if possible. He wanted to negotiate a deal so that the United States could have boop, just that little spot of New Orleans down there. The person he negotiated with, one of the most fascinating people in all of world history, whether you think he's a good guy or a bad guy, he is never boring, and that is the French Emperor Napoleon. This book has a couple of chapters on Napoleon, his rise to power, how he fits in with the French Revolution and how he got to be the emperor of France and then Europe and how he decided to get rid of this huge chunk of land. Jefferson sent a couple of guys over to France to negotiate it for it. We have James Monroe. He became the fifth president just doing this uh, uh, Louisiana purchase thing was just something he did early in his career. And then another guy named Livingston. And I like this Livingston guy because he's maybe the most ridiculously drawn character I've ever done in a Hazardous Tales book. He looks completely silly. He also was hard of hearing. So he had to have one of these brass horns sticking out of his ear that he was holding up. These two guys went to Napoleon to work this deal out. The crazy thing about this book is there's so much information here that I switched up the way this book works. In this book on the gallows are storytellers, Nathan Hale and the hangman and the provost and Billy. They play a game to figure out how they're going to explain this story. So we have this giant wheel, the Louisiana uh, wheel of destiny, and they spin the wheel and different short stories come up. So the book is a collection of a whole bunch of different short stories. So every time they spin the wheel, two stories pop up and we do two stories per chapter. We cover uh, these two guys, we cover uh, Napoleon quite a bit, but the wheel gets crazy and sometimes it spits out things we weren't expecting. For example, it spits out Napoleon's little sister, Pauline Bonaparte, somebody who had a crazy and fascinating life but you don't really hear much about in the history books. Well, guess what? She was mixed up in this Louisiana Purchase thing. Everything uh, about the Louisiana Purchase can be traced back to something outside of the United States, a little island off the coast of Florida down here in the Caribbean. This little island was a French colony called San Domingue, and San Domingue was very important to France because this little tiny colony island gave them a very valuable thing to sell. It gave them sugar and coffee. This little island that created sugar and coffee made tons of money. This little island of San Domingue made more money for the French than all 13 colonies put together ever made for England in its time. But getting sugar and coffee is not easy. So the French did something truly awful. One of the worst things you can do to another human being, they decided to enslave people and get them to harvest the sugar and the coffee. So the island of San Domingue was a colony where slavery was practiced. These enslaved people did not like the role that was given to them by the French empire. So they decided to do something crazy to fight against Napoleon. The leader, and I talk about quite a few of the leaders on this island of San Domingue, but the guy who's on the cover is one of the most fascinating people I have ever read about. His name is Toussaint Louverture. He was a general who fought against Napoleon's troops on this island of San Domingue. This became known as the Haitian Revolution and is one of the most fascinating things I have ever researched for this series. The Haitian Revolution down here in San Domingue led to, in a lot of ways, Thomas Jefferson getting this huge chunk of land which doubled the size of the country. Gets complicated, right? Things get even sillier when a new uh, narrator comes into the series from the wheel. What is that narrator? It's a mosquito. 
A mosquito is brought onto the gallows to help this story because believe it or not, a mosquito has a lot to do with all of this. These mosquitoes were called Aedes aegypti's mosquitoes and they were bad news because they carried in them a virus, the yellow fever virus, which is tied into all of this stuff. The crazy thing is I drew this book during the pandemic. And it's a book about a pandemic. Now I'll tell you this right now, I would much rather get uh, coronavirus or COVID than yellow fever because yellow fever ends with you like vomiting up your organs, which uh, how awesome is that? I get to draw a picture of that happening to somebody in this gruesome book. But fortunately we've had a vaccine for yellow fever since the 1950s, so it's no longer a big issue. But all of this stuff gets tied together in book number 10, Blades of Freedom. I hope you check it out and I hope you enjoy it. It's also a tricky one. I've heard from a few people. A lot of people say this is the best one yet. I've heard a few people say, you know what? It jumps around so much. It was a little confusing. I'm going to have to read it again. And I've had a few people say this is easily the most gruesome and horrifying one yet. Book 10, take a look. Now, Remember when I said I was gonna do 10 cities and talk about something from each of the places? Well, this gives me a little extra opportunity to talk about what I think could be secretly the funniest book in the series. And that is book number two, Big Bad Ironclad. I think this book is very funny. It is about the Civil War and a guy who sort of became kind of the first Navy SEAL. He was a Navy guy named Will Cushing. He joined up in the Navy and he decided to, uh, to fight in the Civil War on the side of the Union. He was a crazy person though. He does so many crazy and daring things in his book. One of the things he does is he decides to take on an ironclad ship practically by himself. Now, if you don't know what an ironclad is, you guys are right there by Hampton Roads, Ironclad Central, where the famous Battle of the Monitor and the Merrimack took place. In fact, you have got a museum that is currently housing the remains of the USS Monitor. It is being kept in a big saltwater bath to kind of treat the, the big metal structure to it so that uh, I think something like 20 years from now, it can be put on display. It was brought up from the bottom of the ocean. I have not got to visit this place, but I would very much love to one of these days uh, out there in Hampton Roads. Um, also, you are not too far from the, uh, the burial site of Will Cushing which is another place I have not been able to go to. People ask me if I get to go research in person all of these places that I uh, draw pictures of. And the sad news is I'm a cartoonist. I have to draw all of this stuff. And you know what doesn't work very well for cartoonists? Drawing and traveling at the same time. It gets very tricky. I've done it before. It is not easy. But what I like is when I happen to be visiting a place for a bookstore visit or a school visit, and I can go check out some of these sites. But you guys are right there, of course, when things are safer and it's easier to go out to museums and, uh, and cemeteries and stuff, go take a look for Will Cushing's gravesite and go pay a visit to uh, the museum that's housing the monitor. Um, this book, as I said, probably the funniest in the series. And I would put it on the opposite end of the spectrum uh, on what I would call the human suffering spectrum. Um, this is probably the book where the least amount of horrible things happen to human beings is Big Bad Ironclad. So if you read uh, Blades of Freedom and you just can't take all of the human misery and suffering and terrible things that are happening, all the beheadings of the French Revolution and all the crazy stuff that happens in uh, San Domingue, well, switch gears, jump back here over to uh, Will Cushing and Big Bad Ironclad where he just pranks his way through the Civil War. Um, now, I'm gonna switch up from drawing for just a second because we are in the, uh, the holiday season where lots of people like to uh, give uh, gifts and stuff. So I'm gonna switch back to the main camera here for a second because I would like to show off um, some books uh, that are comic book history. Uh, a lot of my readers, a lot of uh, parents say, hey, love comics, love history, what would you recommend? There's not a ton out there, so I thought I would show some that are kind of hard to find. Uh, let's jump straight in right off the bat. 
First up, we've got Chris Schweitzer's Krogan Adventures. Now these are history, but they're also historical fiction. These follow the lives of like a big family tree of, uh, of adventurers through all different periods of history. If you want to read some fun and uh, exciting comics of history, big sailing ships and everything, jump into the Krogan Adventures by Chris Schweitzer. Um, he is also working with First Second on their new series called History Comics. Those, uh, for that, he's doing a book on the Lost Colony of Roanoke. It's already out. Check that one out. This one's from Oni Press. Krogan Adventures from Chris Schweitzer. Look for this one. Here's one that's interesting. If you want, uh, if you love nonfiction, but want to switch it up from history, how about some natural history? This is uh, the Earth Before Us series from Abby Howard. This is uh, natural history, dinosaurs, the Ice Age, all of that kind of thing, instead of American history, but it's got a couple of narrators jumping around, showing off all of the science, life science and biology uh, that comes. There's three in this series, goes all the way up to the Ice Age. Check out Earth Before Us, it's a good one. Uh, another fiction series, Tall Ships, period costumes, history fun. That is the, uh, the Compass South Knives Edge books from uh, Hope Larson. These are great, beautifully drawn comics, all kinds of cool history and stuff. These came out just a couple of years ago. Great set of books right here. Lots of history, you're learning a lot, even though it's not nonfiction, it's great historical fiction. Check out Knives Edge and Compass South. A couple of great books there. Now, here's the thing that makes me sad. Do you know a country that has more American history comics than the United States? I do. It's France and Belgium. They're crazy for American history. They've got more cartoon cowboys than we do. More cartoon cowboys. I can't believe it. We have Woody from Toy Story, and he's not even a real cowboy. He's a toy cowboy. But if you go overseas to the great Franco-Belgian comics, these are the people who uh, you know gave us things like Asterix and Obelix and Tintin, and of course the Smurfs. Well, there's an amazing history series called The Blue Coats. Um, this is from a very small press called uh, Cinebook. And uh, these are, um, it's, a, it's a whole series of them. They're these big floppy paperbacks, but it's about a, uh, a little troop of Union soldiers during the Civil War. And they kind of travel around and see all of the highlights of both the American West and the Civil War period. And they cover a lot of great history. The drawings are gorgeous um, and very funny. Lots of good jokes. You start to, you know, kind of learn the crazy personalities of each one of these members of the Blue Coats. But speaking of Will Cushing, check this out. The Blue Coats number two is all about the Monitor and the Merrimack. These guys get involved in the battle. If you want to see another cartoonist take on the Monitor and the Merrimack, get Blue Coats volume two. This is excellent stuff. Beautiful comics from uh, the Franco-Belgian tradition. There are tons of them. I noticed on this one though, as beautifully as these are drawn, this is about a Civil War prison, Robertsville prison. You know what they didn't have in the Civil War? Barbed wire, oops, mistake. They didn't invent civil, uh, barbed wire yet and certainly weren't using it in, uh, in prison camps, but worth a look if you want to read um, some, and some outside perspective of American history but gorgeous, very well drawn. There's a mountain of books in the blue coats. Check those out. Whew. I'm not kidding when I say I got books to talk about. If your favorite book in the series is Treaties, Trenches, Mud and Blood, and I know a lot of people really love the World War I book, you cannot find a better World War I graphic novel than Jacques Tardy's It, is the, it Was the War of the Trenches. Another French cartoonist here. Now this is not funny. This is deadly serious but beautifully drawn. He is one of the masters of the graphic novel artwork. He did two books on uh, World War I. He's got family links to the history in World War I. Uh, an amazing book, Jacques Tardy, It Was the War of the Trenches. If you want more World War I, this is a good one to get. Ah, we're getting down to the last of it here. This, these are big collections of EC comics done in the 50s. These are available from Fantagraphic Books. EC stands for Educational Comics. 
and they did a lot of war comics. They did a lot of horror comics. These are comics that were drawn in the 1950s and they are, they're very intense, beautifully drawn by some just great American master cartoonists. Um, you'll have to just look for the EC library collection. If you're, if you're special ordering from your store, they'll be able to help you figure it out. But this, they jump around. They don't just do American Wars. There are comics in here about Napoleon, about all kinds of stuff. I recommend this one, Bomb Run by John Severin. This is an amazing one. It's got some Korean War stuff in it. Corpse on the Im Chin, Harvey Kurtzman. Beautiful. This is from the same collection. Um, and Ace is High, George Evans. Super good stuff. This, these EC comics are truly amazing pieces of American comic art. And the books are really nice. They're kind of expensive. I think they're like 30 bucks each, but your bookstore will be happy to order these for you. This is good stuff. Last of all, and possibly silliest of all, is a giant series. This was called Horrible Histories. Now, Horrible Histories was super popular in the UK around the same time Harry Potter was popular. They were both like the big publishing things in the UK uh, back in the early 2000s. These are ridiculous. They are so, if you think my books poke fun at things that maybe they shouldn't poke fun of, well, this is even worse. They, they take it over the top in this. And these aren't full comics from top to bottom. There are, uh, you know, text, but there's a lot of comics on every page, lots of jokes and stuff, but they do you know, all kinds of different periods from world history, woeful Second World War, uh, incredible Incas, and these uh, blitzed Brits, these are um, just nothing but facts and jokes, facts and jokes, facts and jokes, just high speed. These were so popular. There's a TV show based off of it. There were movies made. And if you just want gross out facts, you cannot do worse than the... Uh, Horrible histories, order it from your bookstore. All of these, make sure to get them from your uh, bookstore there at Politics and Prose. Excellent stuff. If you don't have uh, history comics or comics on your uh, holiday wish list, put them on there. It's good stuff. Whew. So I've been talking a mile a minute, and I know you guys have a lot of questions. So Let's jump to our Q&A, and uh, since I'm a cartoonist, I will draw your answers out. Oh, that sounds fantastic. Thank you, Nathan. That was amazing. Oof, high speed. I, I tried to jot down as many as I could, and we'll, we'll be following up with some information about that to our viewers. Um, okay, we have a ton of questions. So friends, we might not be able to get to all of your questions. So what I would encourage you to do is you can still submit a question, but I would also love you to go in there and vote on the ones you want most answered because Again, at this point, we have about 44 questions and we won't have time for all of them. So vote 44. on the ones you want. 44. But so let's get right to it because we've got a lot of curious people with awesome questions. Okay. okay. First question is from Jackie. The question is, was history your favorite subject when you went to school? Absolutely not. <laughs> I did not like history at all in school. And one of the reasons is I grew up in Utah. And in Utah, state history that we have to learn about is all about wagons and ladies with bonnets like this, and uh, ugh, that's the, like literally the most boring thing on the universe. I did not love history growing up in school. My favorite subject in school was of course art class. I would much rather be in art class than in history class. I didn't even discover my love of history until I started reading historical fiction. And I didn't start reading historical fiction until I figured out about audio books. Mm -hmm. Audio books got me into history. Excellent question. Yeah, that's great. Great advice to listen to audiobooks too. All right. Um, the next question is when and why were you inspired to make graphic novels? So I did not set out to be a cartoonist. In fact, when I was a kid, I did not read comic books with superheroes in them. I read the newspaper comics every day and I loved those. But when I was a kid, I set out to make picture books. You know, the little 32 page picture book, you know, story time, where the wild things are type of books. I wanted to be a picture book author. I wanted to be one so much that I submitted my first picture book submission when I was a senior in high school. I did it for 10 years before I finally got one published. Sad thing is none of my picture books were uh, very popular. Oh. I was just not, 
my sense of humor was, a little, I don't know, a little too weird. I wasn't really a good fit for young story time kids. Kids are like, this is a creepy story. Um, I ran into another author who had my same last name. That author's name was Shannon Hale. We are not related, but we were both at a conference. And I said, hey, my name's Hale, your name's Hale. And she said, I have seen your picture books. They're very fun. You know what they look like? They look like graphic novels. And graphic novels are going to be very popular in the future. I don't know if she's some kind of time traveler or something, but she knew what was up. This was before Raina Talgemeier, before Smile or anything. She said, we should do a graphic novel. I will write it and you can draw the pictures. And I said, well, I do picture books. And she said, wait till you hear my idea. My idea is Rapunzel. But our Rapunzel is mean and she lives in the old West and she uses her long hair to beat people up. It's a Western version of Rapunzel. And I said, that sounds awesome. We did Rapunzel's Revenge. Suddenly this book was the most popular of all of my books. It was on the Today Show. Al Roker held it up as the book of the month. And I said, wow, forget about picture books. I'm gonna do graphic novels from now on. So I blame Shannon Hale and Al Roker for getting me into graphic novels. That is a great story. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, let's see. We have a question from Gradis, uh, who is a fifth grader from Bernard, Barnard, um, asks, who is your favorite art author? Hmm, my favorite author growing up, um, I had a couple, I already mentioned Where the Wild Things Are. I loved Where the Wild Things Are by Mari Sendak. I wanted to go explore that creepy island and see those monsters. I loved it more than anything. So I drew and drew and drew so I could get as good as he was. And I'm still not that good, but I loved his illustrations and his drawings. But my favorite book when I was in school, when I was a kid and reading lots of books, was not Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. It was the sequel, Charlie and the Great Glass Elevator, where Willy Wonka and Charlie go into space. And I'm not kidding, they fight giant slug aliens. If you haven't read Char uh, Charlie and the Great Glass Elevator, check that one out. Only rolled doll, perfect. Okay, mm -hmm. let's see. We have a question from Theo and Grace. They are asking, um, well, one of them is asking, I'm actually related to the original Nathan Hale, the spy, are wow. you? We know we talked about this a little in the intro, but um, if you're not, how did you get your name? Ah, okay. So here's the thing. Nathan Hale, when he was executed, he was only 22 and did not have any children. So he has zero direct descendants, but he had an older brother and I don't know, that older brother wasn't spying. He was busy having nine kids. And I was at a book signing and a woman who was part of the Hale Family Foundation came up afterwards. And I said, oh, do you know much about the genealogy? And she said, I'm an expert. I know everything about the genealogy. And if your family goes back to the 1800s in the United States and your last name is Hale, you are most likely almost definitely related to the Hale family. Not Nathan Hale because he had no kids, but his older brother. And here's the crazy thing. I dug a little deeper in the research and found out that I am not directly related to Nathan Hale because nobody is, but I am directly related to uh, his boss, Thomas Knowlton, the guy that hired him. Remember that guy who gets killed in the battle? I'm related to Nathan Hale's boss, direct <laughs> relative. How weird is that? That's wild. Great story. Thank you. Okay, we have a question from Mackay, who is also a fifth grader at Barnard, asks, how did you continue writing the book during the pandemic? How did it affect you? Ah, okay. So I do two parts when I'm doing a graphic novel. I have to do the writing and I do that completely. I, I finish the whole manuscript before I draw a single thing and then I draw it, right? Now, I had written the entire manuscript before. I got the drawing part handed back to me when? March of 2020. So pretty much the second the pandemic kicked off. And this is all about protests, the French Revolution, marching in the streets. Does that sound familiar? Pandemic, all of this stuff. It was easily, I think, the hardest book I've ever had to work on. I know a lot of people when the pandemic started were just kind of sitting there trying to figure out how to work. And this was me. I was trying to jumpstart drawing. I just I just couldn't figure out how to work. My, my kids were home from school. Everybody was stuck in the house. 
But uh, somehow I figured it out and started drawing it. But I got to tell you, this is what my face looked like the whole time <laughs> drawing all of this stuff during the pandemic. I don't want to do any disease books for a long time. And hopefully I'll never do a book about 2020. Because I've had about enough of this year. You guys probably feel about the same. I hear you. Yes, exactly. Okay, great. Um, we have a question from Kennedy, who is also a fifth grader from Barnard, asks, does writing energize you or exhaust you? Hmm, that's a very good question. Does yes. writing energize me or exhaust me? <laughs> um, I'm gonna say both. Um, I'll start the day energized and sit down with all the research and then uh, pretty soon I start getting exhausted or the reverse. Sometimes I'll wake up, sit down at my desk and just look exhausted. And then when I start researching, I get energized. The main thing I've learned about writing and drawing comics is you have to do something. You gotta put those lines of text on the screen. You gotta take them out of your brain. You gotta put them in the screen. You gotta keep the pencil moving the whole time. If you're not adding things to the finished product, you're just spinning your wheels. And boy, you can spend forever at your desk just staring at you. You probably know this doing homework. You just stare at that desk and you it's you gotta move the lines. That's That's my thing. If letters aren't going up on the screen, if lines aren't going down on the page, you're not doing anything. You're just making yourself even sicker. I've noticed if I can see the lines going up, if I can see the drawings going down, it's more energizing. I don't know why it's more draining to sit there and do nothing and more energizing to put stuff down. But for me, it is. Good question. That's super helpful advice. Okay, great. Uh, we have a question from Zachary Small. And the question is, after Blades of Freedom, what book are you planning on making next? Can you share oh, that? Oh, guess what? Book 11 is being worked on right now. I am in the writing stage of it. I cannot tell you what it's going to be about. I can tell you that the color will be blue, dark blue. And I can tell you that I spent all day yesterday drawing, uh, writing, I'm, I'm not to the drawing part yet, writing about a really horrifying tank battle but that's all I can tell you. It'll be out next fall, okay. working as fast as I can. And also during the pandemic, I started doing something crazy. Uh, I'm so used to traveling around and doing stuff. Suddenly I had more time than usual, which is not something I've ever said before, but I decided I, I draw so much on the computer. It's been a long time since I've drawn just on paper, all of the Hazardous Tales books drawn on this very computer that you're looking at in a program called Photoshop. But I thought, you know what? I'm going to switch things up. I'm going to go back to my roots. Rapunzel's Revenge, the first graphic novel I drew, I drew with ink pens on Canson paper, Bristol board. Every morning I wake up before I do anything else, before I even did this uh, interview today, I'm two hours behind you guys, I wake up and I draw a little comic. I'm making it up as I go. No color, just black and white. I, am, I just finished page 63 on this comic today. It is not about history. It is complete and total nonsense. Nobody's seen it, but I think it's gonna be very exciting. When I finish it, I might send it to the publisher and the publisher might say, uh, this is total nonsense. We're not gonna publish this. And then I'll find a different publisher who does like it. But I've been waking up every day drawing these crazy comics. It's got dinosaurs, it's got giant apes, it's got all kinds of silly stuff, but it's been fun to just wake up, zero research, zero planning, and just draw a comic every day. 63 pages in, super excited about it. That's fantastic. So people should just get up and do that in the morning. Yeah, yeah. just draw. Drawing's yeah. fun. Yeah. Okay, we have a question from Kamla, uh, also a fifth grader from Barnard, asks, if you did not write books, what would you be doing? If I didn't draw and write comics, I know exactly what I would want to do. I would want to be a national park ranger and go and stand in front of uh, great scenes of natural beauty with a big shaggy beard and just be like, blah, 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 blah. And you get one of these cool hats like Smokey Bear. Park ranger. That's my job. Awesome. Do you have a favorite park, national park that you like to visit? My absolute favorite park in the entire world is Capitol Reef in Utah. Beautiful Red Rock Desert still not as popular as the other Utah parks like Zion and Bryce and those ones get very, very, very busy. Capitol Reef still fairly quiet. Arches is too busy. Went to Arches earlier this year, the uh, 10 o'clock in the morning, it said the park is at maximum capacity. We're not letting anybody else in. 
Oh. Sorry, Arches. Mm, well, this is a good, um, something for us to keep in mind when we can travel again. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, we have a question. I know this is a hard question to answer, but Allison does want to know, what is your favorite book that you've written? Always hard to pick a favorite um, because there's different things I like about them. Um, I told you Big Bad Iron Cloud, I think is the funniest, the hardest one to write before book number 10 was my World War I book. That one was really hard. The funnest one to draw was the John Wesley Powell Major Impossible book because I love drawing all the beautiful Grand Canyon rocks and stuff. Um, my favorite character is the Harriet Tubman book, The Underground Abductor. So it's, it's different parts that I have that are favorite. But usually my easy answer, and nobody likes it, is I say my favorite is the next one that I'm working on right now. Because when I'm working on it, I'm in it, I'm excited about everything that's going on in there. And I'm also like, ooh, maybe this book will be the biggest book ever that will blow the lid off the whole series and it'll be more popular than Harry Potter or Wimpy Kid or whatever. You know, you, you gotta have these fantasies in your head while you're working. <laughs> the so next good. one is the one I'm excited about. Perfect answer. Okay, Spencer would like to know, how did you come up with the idea for the Hazardous Tale series? Ah, you know, I, uh, I had drawn a mini comic. I used to do a web comic and I kept it updated with five days a week comics. And I did that for about three years. Every single day of the week, I would put up a new little mini comic about anything. I did science, I did goofy stuff. And I, I found a weird fact about Lewis and Clark once. And I put that uh, in a little eight page mini comic. This little comic somehow found its way into the inbox of uh, the art director at Abrams Books. And he said, hey, you should do comics about history. And I was like, yeah, that'd be fun. Let's do a Lewis and Clark book. And that somehow over the course of uh, talking to the editor and get, getting it all figured out became the Hazardous Tales series. Now here's the funny thing. We still haven't done that Lewis and Clark book. Oh. One of these days. Yeah. We'll get to yeah. it. That's neat because what I'm hearing from you is that, you know, you just love to draw. You're just getting up and doing it no matter what. And I think that's great advice for kids who are interested in, in that field mm -hmm. and being artists or being graphic designers or making graphic novels. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Okay. Chris Junker would like to know what made you choose the stories you do and the order that you have that you oh. make. Uh, okay. So the order uh, is just totally random. Um, there's no real order. I don't have a master plan other than I love drawing crazy history. And that's the big thing too. I don't pick subjects that are the most important, the most historical, the most momentous. I pick subjects that seem like they will be the most fun to draw, mm. right? So I'll get kids say, hey, you've got to do a book on the Great Depression. And I'll be like, that doesn't sound very fun to draw. People sitting around with no money. People say, oh, you got to do a bit, you know, a book on, uh, I, it's got to be fun to draw. That's got to be the number one thing. And because the series is the hazardous, it's got to be, you know, dangerous action, exciting things, amazing, wonderful things have happened in our country, but they're not very fun to draw sometimes. So what do I pick? I, th I pick the things that I think will have great action scenes, explosions, cool vehicles, cool costumes, military stuff, you know, the stuff I like to draw. Because when you're a cartoonist, you got to spend all day with this stuff. You know the type of book? There's one type of book right now that is more popular than any other type of graphic novel. And that is graphic novels about kids in school and they're sad because they don't fit in. That's the most popular genre right now. Oh, I wish I fit in at school. Now, I would love to write a book like that, but you know what I can't stand drawing? Kids sitting at desks. <laughs> if you wanna have a rough day, draw page after page of kids sitting at desks, because that's what these artists have to do. Raina Telgemeier, uh, Jerry Craft, all of these guys, they have got to draw these really boring scenes of kids sitting in classrooms. They're great books, they're fun books, but I just can't, I can't draw schools. You know what's the worst thing in the world? A locker, hallways of lockers. I don't want to draw that. I want to draw, you know, the Merrimack getting pounded by cannonballs or Napoleon getting shot off of his horse. It really just, like, it sounds silly, but I choose subjects that are fun to draw. I mean, that makes sense. They like to do what they like to do, and you like to do what you like to do, and people love reading your book. So I would say just keep loving doing what you're doing. 
Mm, okay, I, I'm excited about this next question because I did read in an interview that you did that you try to stay as close to the truth as possible, but you said some of the things that are that that are true are some of the weirdest things. So this yes. next question kind of falls into that. The question is from Raviv, and the question is: Did Pauline Bonaparte actually have her husband's heart in a cup? Yes, <laughs> <No>. she did. <laughs> um, spoiler alert: If you haven't read the book. I believe you can even visit it. I believe it might be in like one of the uh, the family mausoleums. But yes, Leclerc's heart was placed in a silver cup. Um, now here's, here's what's maddening about research. I had found this little piece of research that it, she wanted it to put the heart in a silver cup. And then I lo I couldn't find that when I, this, this was uh, years before when I was just kind of looking for subjects and ideas and stuff. And uh, Pauline Bonaparte, Napoleon's little sister. Oh, she's the craziest. She's so much fun. Um, I can't wait for, if you haven't read the book, I can't wait for you to meet this, this crazy person. Um, when it came time to do the research again, I got a whole bunch of books. I've got this huge, I probably got the biggest collection of Pauline Bonaparte books in my state because I went and tracked all of them down. There aren't that many. There's maybe five or six. And you can get giant volumes on Napoleon and she'll only have like three pages in it. I've got those too. But I couldn't find this original thing where she demanded that her husband heart be placed in the cup. Um, I was able to find, uh, you know, his remains are here. The, here's, I was finally able to, uh, to, to come up with this, this memorial urn. I guess it was something that they sort of did in those days. But yes, she put his heart in a silver cup. I might have fudged the timeline. <laughs> I make her do it. I, I have her do it before the ship journey. Um, it most likely would have happened after she got back to France, but still. Artistic license. <laughs> That's right. Right. The heart ended up in that cup. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for that question, Ruby. That's That was fun. Okay, we have a question from Jackie who asks or says, I'm a fifth grader from Washington, D.C., and I'm wondering if anyone else you know or are related to does graphic novels like you. Is it run in the family? <laughs> hmm. I am not related to any graphic novelists, but uh, I have a daughter who is in uh, high school. She's 14. No, she's 15. Um, she's stuck in uh, quarantine, just like the rest of you. Um, she is better at drawing than I was at her age, mm -hmm. but she's also better at sculpting. Um, I keep getting her to try doing comics, but you guys know how 15 year olds, they're not going to, they're not going to do what you tell them to sit, to do. But um, if she wants to, she could be an excellent cartoonist. And the crazy thing is she's got to come with me on lots of uh, author visits and stuff. She came with me to uh, San Diego Comic-Con a bunch of times. So she meets all of these cartoonists. We were at uh, ALA, the big librarian convention where I had a table set up and uh, a whole bunch of other artists had their table set up. And guess what? Super boring conference for a kid to be stuck at. She was supposed to go with her cousin, but she got stuck with me that day. In any case, we were sitting there and at each one of these tables back there were all of the great graphic novelists. Raina Telgemeier was sitting over here. We had Dan Santat over here. And my little daughter just wandered from table to table. She hung out with them, drew pictures in the sketchbook, met these people. They drew pictures for her. She came back to me and you know what she said? Dad, this is so boring. <laughs> Spoiled. Aww. Totally spoiled. Aw, she'll appreciate it someday. I hope so. I hope she still has that sketchbook with all of those great drawings from those other creators. No kidding. Okay, um, Parker Wilson has a question. And the question is, you could either answer at the age or the year, but when did you write your first book? Uh, so, I was probably... Uh, I took a piece of paper and folded it in half when I was a very, very little kid. And then I figured out, well, oh, you put another piece of paper and fold it in half, stick it inside there, you got a book. And I, I drew this story about a, a, a scuba diver who was stuck in a fishbowl and I couldn't write yet. So however old I was, I couldn't write yet. So I, I, I have that story somewhere. I, I, I was, I don't know, probably four or something. Yeah. But I, I consider that to be my first story. The yeah. first book I submitted, uh, I submitted to a publisher when I was 18. It was a 72-page a, a choose-your-own-adventure book where every page you chose uh, had the character getting killed in a horrible way. <laughs> so no wonder they didn't publish it. <laughs> That's awesome. 
Um, okay, we have a question from Darwin, a fifth grader from Barnard asks, how long did it take you to write this new book? Uh, this new book was about uh, four, four to five months for the research. And then um, I started it in March and did all of the drawing in, uh, in three months. It's one of the fastest I've ever done. That's because I was in lockdown. I couldn't go anywhere. Uh, Dawn or Party used to be my fastest book because I did that in uh, like three months and a week. This one I did inside of three months. Why? Trapped in lockdown, nowhere else to go. That's my fastest one. Uh, but if you add them together, each book takes between seven and eight months. I'm trying, I'm always trying to get faster. The first uh, book that Rapunzel's Revenge, that took almost 12 months of drawing and coloring and I didn't even do the writing. Yeah. Um, so I'm trying to get faster and faster as I go. Um, the crazy thing, these books require too much history and research to just wake up and make up a page every day. But this book where I'm just making up a page every day, I love it because it's been 62 days and I got 62 pages. Yeah. Okay, we have a question from Maya Bernstein and she wants to know, this is getting um, a lot of votes. In okay. Donner's Dinner Party, how did yes. you figure out about all the people in it and the people who died? Ah, so... The Donner Party, um, the, if you look in the back of the Donner Party, one of my favorite uh, two-page spreads in the whole series of Hazardous Tales is in the back of that book. It sort of looks like a yearbook. It has all of the people who made that journey, the official roster of the Donner Party. It shows all of their little faces, and then it shows if they, if they survived or if they didn't. Um, now, a handful of the people, we know exactly what happened to them. How do we know that? They kept journals. They wrote it all down. Um, there's a bunch of people in there. We know they died, and that's it. There's no other information. One of the most heartbreaking things in it is there's two one-year-old twins, and one of them did not complete the journey, but the other one did. And that's all we really know about them. That's all you can dig up in the research. Um, Along the top, we talk about um, how they died. You know, there's a little icon down in the corner. One of my favorite resources for the Donner Party book was this weird giant book that was put out by a Reno newspaper. See, they were in the mountains between Nevada and California. And uh, right now, the, uh, the beautiful town of Reno is about the closest. You go up here, uh, you know, Lake Tahoe and a bunch of beautiful places are up here. But up there in the middle is Donner Lake. If you remember the story, they got up, they couldn't get out this way or that way once the snow came down. Um, this Reno newspaper did this amazing job of every day in the paper, they talked about what was happening with the Donner Party on that exact day. Um, so every day there was this little depressing column in the, I think it was the Reno Gazette, uh, talking about what the Donner Party did on this day. This was a super helpful resource. I've been up to Donner Park and seen that site, talked to the museum uh, owners there. They've told me that Donner Dinner Party is one of their best sellers at the uh, the gift shop up there at the Donner Party, uh, at Donner Pass. Um, also, if you don't know about it, um, the publisher has put out some new supersized series. You can talk to the bookstore about them. They're called the Bigger and Badder Editions. They're almost twice the size of the books and they also have about 16 extra pages of mini comics in the back. So far we've done the Alamo and the Donner Party book. So check those out. They've got a little bit more information in them. Yeah. Okay, we probably only have time for maybe two more questions or so. We have over 50 questions still in the queue. So oh, many smokes. questions, I know. We'll, let's go lightning round, we'll do fast ones. <laughs> okay, let's try to get two or three more questions in. Lightning back. round. <laughs> I like this question. Danny P asks, how do you feel when you finish writing a book? I feel great. I also feel tired because no matter how hard I work, no matter how much I'm at my desk every day, when it comes down to the final week, I have to pull at least one all-nighter and I get so wiped out. And then the terrible thing is when you finish a book like that, it's not completely finished because there's a lot of little edits that have to be made and then there's some color corrections and then they send some prints out and you have to go through the prints and then fix them then. And then only then does it go to the publisher. And then once it goes to the publisher, it's like six months until you see a final, final uh, finished book. So if you are an impatient person like me, uh, it takes forever to get results. You never know when the final day was. Hmm. Um, this kind of goes along with it, but Thomas wants to know, do you ever get tired of drawing cartoons? 
Um, not yet. <laughs> All right. Not yet. Someday maybe, but not yet. Okay, good. I'm glad. Okay, Allison wants to know why make your stories as graphic novels? Ooh, you know, that's a very good question. Um, I love history, but I love being able to see stuff. You're always hearing about uh, things like, you know, like the Battle of Bunker Hill. And uh, it's very important, but in a book, you don't quite get why it's so important. But if you can see a picture that the cannons on the top of Bunker Hill and Breed's Hill can actually fire their cannons and they can hit the, uh, the British ships down in the, uh, in the bay, then you're like, oh, now I get it. And plus it's fun to look at these little ships and these little cannons. Graphic novels, they make it fun to read. Absolutely. Okay, uh, this kind of goes along with that as well, but Justin wants to know, how do you get so many details in your drawing? Um, I, I don't know. Uh, I, I like to make sure things look right. I like to make sure the boots and the guns and everything look right. And if I do all of the research to dig up and, uh, and find what that thing looks like, well, I wanna make sure that that goes into the book. Sometimes I worry my drawings aren't detailed enough. Mm. Um, but uh, yeah, a lot of it just comes from looking for pictures, looking for research, and then drawing it in. As you can tell, I just like drawing. Uh, I never stop. This is what I do all day, every day. I think I've got a problem. I think I'm addicted to drawing. So when it comes time to draw cool stuff, I just jump right in. That's great. Okay, well, we're going to end on this last question. And okay, Benjamin here we wants go. to know, drum roll, can you make another series with the hangman? Ah, oh, another series with the hangman. Mm. What would he do? Would it be like, it would be fun to just go completely opposite Instead of doing history, it's just like hangman and he, uh, I don't know, he lives in a, in a pineapple under the sea. I don't, I don't even know. <laughs> just doing stupid stuff like SpongeBob all day. Or maybe hangman has to get a job in a, in a corporate office and he, he hates his life. Maybe the hangman becomes a superhero and flies around like Captain Underpants. Hmm. Something you know what? I like this idea. There's a lot to think about here. I do like the hangman. He's very fun to draw. There you go. Uh, wow, you guys had a lot of amazing questions. And so thank many. Thank you so much. You. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Thank you so much for all the for submitting all those questions and for watching today, Nathan. Thank you so much for being here. It was such a joy talking to you and and listening to your stories and seeing your drawing live. That was so much fun. Thank you. Thanks for having me. This yeah. was a lot of fun. Yeah. So Book you are. Can... Yeah, so you can get a copy of the newest book, Blades of Freedom. You can click on the link in our chat box that will take you right to Politics and Prose to get your book, along with some of other Nathan's books. Um, yeah, thank you so much for being here. We had such a great time, such a great time. And thanks, everybody. Um, please, you know, follow Politics and Prose. You can watch this later on our YouTube channel. Um, and we just want you to keep reading widely and coming back and seeing us again. And hopefully we'll get to see you again in person very soon, hopefully. I hope so. Enjoy history and comics, everybody. Keep reading. <laughs>